The Bhagavad Gita is seen as the flagship scripture for Hindus. In just 700 verses, we find a neat blending together of the profoundest wisdom and various philosophies within Hinduism. But unfortunately, many Hindus, despite knowing about the Gita, are completely unaware of its contents, often not motivated or perhaps feeling incapable of understanding what is being said. This short three-part series aims to present the key concepts that Krishna explains in the most accessible and comprehensible way. To begin with, let us understand the place of the Gita within Hindu scripture as a whole. The Vedas are seen in principle as the highest authority and have been divided into the Rig, Sama, Yajur and Atharva. Each of the Vedas can loosely be divided further into two general sections. One is the Karmakanda, which is made of hymns and instructions centred around the Vedic ritual known as the Yajna. This is where the different gods of nature such as Indra, Agni and Soma are worshipped to achieve different goals. The other section of the Veda is the Jnanakanda. This is primarily based on texts known as the Upanishads and here we find various teachings and truths outlining the metaphysical relationship between Atman, the Self and Brahman, the Supreme Reality. The Vedas were divided up by Sage Vyasa, who also composed the great work known as the Mahabharata, which is an embellished record of historical events that took place some 5,000 years ago. Comprising more than 100,000 verses, the Mahabharata describes the conflict between two sets of cousins, the five righteous Pandavas, of which Arjuna is one, and the arrogant deceitful Kaurava brothers headed by Duryodhana. The feud climaxes on the Kurukshetra battlefield, where all the kings in the land are ready to start the greatest war the world has seen. The Bhagavad Gita picks up the narrative from here. The Gita contains 18 chapters and is best seen as being divided into thirds. The first third primarily focuses on an extended explanation of Karma Yoga and how this can bring one to true knowledge of our essential nature. The middle third brings a dramatic shift where Krishna explains his true form as the Supreme Lord. He reveals the beauty of devotion before showing his ultimate cosmic form to Arjuna. The final third is a further grounding discourse on various topics such as the philosophy of Sankhya, the three qualities that govern creation, and the relationship between Atman and the Supreme Being. Chapter 1 begins with Dhritarashtra, the blind king, who is the father of the Kauravas, anxiously asking Sanjaya, his charioteer, what is happening on the battlefield. Sanjaya, with his gift of mystic sight, narrates how the two armies are bracing for battle. With Krishna as his charioteer, Arjuna scans the enemy ranks. He sees his cousins, grandfather, teacher and friends. Suddenly he is overcome with emotion. The prospect of slaying those whom he has loved and served his entire life brings him to a point of collapse. He is overcome with sympathy and confused about what is the right course of action. Alas, alas, we are bent on performing a most sinful deed by slaying our family members due to our greed for the pleasure of sovereignty. If the sons of the Drashtha, weapons in hand, were to slay me in battle unresisting and unarmed, that would be better for me. Krishna keeps silent for the whole chapter while Arjuna spills out his thoughts. Eventually, from emotional exhaustion, Arjuna surrenders to him in helplessness. Krishna now leaves behind the guise of a charioteer and friend and assumes the role of a spiritual master. Immediately, he draws Arjuna out of his emotional indulgence and into a grander vision of reality, explaining that the real truth to be known is that we are the Atman, the divine self. This self is eternal, untouched by the physical elements, aloof from this material existence. It is never born and it never dies. It is existing now and it will never cease to exist. It is unborn, eternal, everlasting and most ancient. It is not killed when the body is killed. Whether in childhood or old age, the Atman is unchanging. Just as we change clothes every day, the Atman too sheds and adorns new bodies. Every life is just one story in the Atman's journey. Arjuna is being made aware that beyond the body and mind, there is a deeper reality, which is who we truly are. Krishna describes his philosophy of identifying with the Atman as Sankhya, which means an analysis. By analysing reality, we can come to the conclusion 
that there is the world which is made up of physical elements, but distinct from this, there is the eternal divine Atman. While stressing this higher knowledge, Krishna also points out practical guidance. Fundamentally, Arjuna is a Kshatriya or warrior. His role in society is to stand and protect righteousness. His dharma or duty, therefore, is not to run away from his responsibility, but to rise and meet the need of a situation. Having described the nature of the Atman and the importance of one's dharma, Krishna criticizes those who do not think of higher ideals, but only on the materialistic and ritualistic part of the Vedic practice. The point Krishna makes is that those who use religion to enjoy pleasures in the afterlife lack wisdom. Life and spiritual pursuit should be used to transcend material pleasures, not to revel in it in another life. Detachment as well as the performance of one's righteous duty provides the foundation for one of the most important ideas in the whole Gita, Karma Yoga. You only have a right to the action itself and never to the fruits of that action. Do not make the rewards of action your motive and do not develop any attachment for avoiding action. This is the essence of Karma Yoga, that we should act in the world without attachment to the results of those actions. This requires one to master the senses. Like a tortoise that withdraws its limbs, we need to withdraw our attention away from the outside world. Krishna points out that it is desire that entraps our consciousness, carrying our mind away, like the wind that carries a boat on the ocean. We have to remove this sense of I and mine, and thereby centre ourselves within. But going within doesn't mean giving up on acting in the world. Krishna explains that action is life itself, we cannot escape it. Even to maintain our body, we need to act. Our very breathing is action. Karma Yoga is all about being in the world, but not of it. It is not about external renunciation, but internal renunciation of desire. But if we are detached without any desire, why would we act at all? The true Karma Yogi is set beyond any selfish motive. He acts not for his gain, but for the welfare of the world, or as the Gita puts it, Loka Sangraha. This is unconditional selfless action untainted by the ego. Krishna points out to Arjuna that even he himself has nothing to gain. He has no desires, but yet he acts, not for himself, but for the benefit of others. The ignorant individuals, deluded by their sense of I and mine, believe that they are acting. But a true karma yogi sees the reality, that all action takes place in the realm of nature and the self, the Atman, is not touched by any of it. Desire is the obstacle to seeing this. It blinds our vision like smoke from a fire. Desire invades our senses, mind and the intellect. The goal is to master ourselves through yoga. But this knowledge is nothing new. Krishna states that this ancient science is being resurrected by him, but was originally taught to the sun deity Viviswan and was passed down by different persons through the ages. At this point, Krishna famously declares why he has incarnated on earth. Whenever there is a decline in dharma, O Parata, and whenever there is an increase in adharma, it is then that I manifest myself. This is the concept of avatar, that the ultimate personality, the supreme consciousness descends to this material plane to destroy ignorance, to save and elevate earnest seekers. Having declared his divinity and the purpose of his descent, Krishna proceeds to really pin down the difference between karma and karma yoga. One who perceives inaction in action, and action in inaction, is intelligent amongst men. He is properly engaged and performs his duty. But what does Krishna really mean by this? Karma is action that produces consequences. Anybody who is identified with their mind and ego is bound and constantly creating both good and bad karma through their thoughts and intentions. But to the one who has no desire, no attachments and has mastered his senses, even if he engages in action, taking on all kinds of responsibility, such a person commits no karma and there are no consequences to his actions. Therefore, outwardly, he seems to engage in karma or action, but ultimately, a karma or inaction is what is actually happening. On the other hand, if an individual who is not free from desire and attachments 
does nothing outwardly or in action, he is still creating karma or action through his thoughts, feelings and state of consciousness. The subtle point being made is that inaction through avoiding our duty and role in life actively breeds consequences. In other words, our indifference and lack of intervention to situations which demand our attention will also give birth to future karmic results. This is particularly relevant to Arjuna who is bent on running away from his duty. Krishna states to act without attachment to the results is yagya. Yagya is not just a fire ceremony, it is an inner process where one makes sacrifices for a higher ideal. In this sense, our yoga practice to gain mastery over the mind and senses is also a form of yagya. But what is the actual end result of this yagya? Krishna says that by detaching our attention from the world, by centering ourselves within, we receive jnana or true realized knowledge of the Atman. It is this state of consciousness that actually burns up all karmic consequences. We are no longer a materially conditioned person, we are centered within. Once you recognize the Atman within, you can see the Atman everywhere. This wisdom allows one to rise beyond any form of judgment and see the inherent unity that underpins all creation. The learned pundit perceives the same reality within a Brahmin endowed with wisdom, a cow, an elephant, a dog, and one who eats dogs. The yogi realizes that it is the same divinity that sustains all life and so there is no distinction of higher or lower. To become such a yogi we have to be detached from material desires, then one is ready to enter into deep contemplation of the divine. The goal of dhyana yoga or meditation is to still the incessant fluctuations of the mind to realize the truth. As Krishna states, by constantly engaging himself in this way, the yogin who controls his mind attains the state of tranquility, which culminates in nirvana, which actually rests upon me. Meditating in the correct way, the mind should be like a lamp in a windless place that never flickers. Such a state gives rise to the highest joy and supreme peace, free from any stain of suffering. But, as Arjuna says, the mind is more difficult to control than the wind, how is this even possible? In response Krishna reiterates that consistent, repeated practice will yield results. However much the mind strays, we must repeatedly bring it back to the goal. Even if we do not achieve the goal in this life, nothing is lost. We will inevitably take birth in the right context and situation which will allow us to further our practice towards the goal. In this way, Krishna makes clear that we are on a cosmic journey over many lives to attain the Supreme. But who is the Supreme? Krishna explains that among all spiritual aspirants, the Yogi is the highest. And among the Yogis, the one who is in contemplation of him is the highest of all. This last verse of chapter 6 sets the tone for the next six chapters, where Krishna dramatically shifts the line of discourse. Up until now, Krishna has spent most of his time on how one can go within and detach from the world. Now it is time for Krishna to explain and show that he himself is the Supreme Lord and the goal of all spiritual endeavour. Many thanks for listening.